there's something you'd like to share with us, if you'd like more information about the church, you can fill that connection card out. You can also go online if you don't do it here and fill something out there. These connection cards can be turned in uh, to the offering boxes at the back door. We don't collect an offering within the church service, but rather if you came prepared to return your tithes and offerings, you can do so by putting them in uh, the two offering boxes that are outside the doors, outside these doors right here, following the service. Uh, or you can always, of course, give online as the majority of our church does at spencervillechurch.org slash give. And we thank you for your continued support and your giving towards first and foremost tithe and then our local church budget and also our capital budget which pays for the various facility needs that we have and the property that we are continuing to pay off. I wanna welcome also those who have joined us uh, and are watching us live right now from all over the world. I wanna say in particular a greeting to Joan Wheaton who I met this sat last Sabbath. I was in another state and I met Joan and uh, she and her husband began watching us during COVID. They are from Tennessee, and I also wanna let her know that we are praying for her. Her husband, John, passed away just a couple months ago, but she has said she's continued to be blessed by this church, and she especially likes uh, Michael Patterson's music, and I'm sure she'll be blessed by the music today. So we welcome her, and we welcome all the others that are joining us from all over the country and all over the world. And we pray that all of you are blessed as we worship here this morning. As we enter into the prelude time, what we encourage you to do is to spend a little bit of time while the prelude is going on just to invite, ask God to into your heart and to speak to you however he chooses to do so during this service. It's a time for us to prepare our hearts and our minds to really enter in to the worship of God. So this time, let us do that.
Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for bringing us into this place. We have individually invited you into our hearts, into our lives, into our minds to speak to us today as you see best. Lord, we now corporately ask for your presence to be with us. May your angels walk amongst the aisles and may the Holy Spirit descend upon each of us, I pray in your name. Amen. You may be seated. children to uh, come forward for the children's story. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, can you raise your hand if you have ever been lost? All right. I see a lot of hands. I, too, have been lost many times before, and today I'm going to tell you a little story about when that happened to me. 
Now, at the time, me and my family were living in a large apartment complex. And this was a big apartment complex. Many stories, dozens of halls, hundreds upon hundreds of doors. So you can imagine. So I was two at the time. And, well, you know, two-year-olds are pretty curious about everything that's happening in the world around them. They don't really know much at the time. So every week or every other week, my dad would go up to do the laundry. And now in this apartment complex, the laundry was not in the room, but it was on the third story. And everyone shared the same laundry room. So if you want to do laundry, you'd go up to the third story and do it. So my dad would go to do the laundry. And one of these days that he went up to do the laundry, I decided that I wanted to find out what he was actually doing up there. So he left with the laundry. A few minutes later, I walked out the door. The thing is, I didn't actually know where he went when he did the laundry, but I knew he was somewhere. So I set off on my expedition to find my dad. Of course, I went in the opposite direction of where he actually was. It didn't take long for my mom to realize that the house was awfully quiet. I was a two-year-old, so you know, I made a lot of noise. So she started looking around for me. Where could he be? Then she realized the door was still open. So she ran up to my dad and she said, is Lance with you? And my dad said, no. Then panic ensued. My parents ran through the entire apartment complex, all through the halls, passing hundreds and hundreds of doors. They looked everywhere. They went outside, they looked in the parking lot, they looked by the pool, they looked everywhere they could possibly think of. So finally, they decided that they wanted to call the police. But before they did that, my dad wanted to check one more time. So he went to the complete opposite side of the apartment complex, the complete opposite side, and started going up the stairs. The first story of stairs, nothing. The second flight of stairs, nothing. But he heard a small sound almost like a voice, so he ran up the last flight of stairs, and there I was. I turn around, and I look him in the eye, and I say, Daddy, I found you. <laughs> the, lesson this, the lesson that I learned from this is that when I was looking for my dad, and there was chaos all around me, I was calm, because I had one goal in mind, to find him. So that really taught me, in this world, when chaos is happening, we need to have our goal in mind so we can stay calm through it all. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this wonderful Sabbath that we can come together and worship your name. Help us to learn lessons from today's sermon and help us to enjoy the rest of this wonderful day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning, dear church. Thank you for this beautiful prayer. Now we have special time for prayer, and uh, before we pray, I want to express my great gratitude in the name of my family, in the name of my country, where I'm coming from. Thank you for your prayers for Ukraine. Thank you for all your help. Thank you for all your support. We really appreciate your kindness and love. Thank you. And let us kneel down before our Heavenly Father and pray together. Our Father, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy in our lives, in our families, in our communities. Thank you, Lord, for the great gift of today. Thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath day. Thank you for the forgiveness and hope in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of prayer. Being in your presence brings healing and joy to our hearts. Father, there is so much pain and sorrow in the world we live in. We pray especially for Ukraine, for people of Ukraine who are suffering and are spread throughout the world looking for safety and protection. We pray for people of Russia. We pray for our world. We pray for shalom in our hearts. But most of all, we ask, please come soon. We want home, Lord. May your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But as long as we are here in this world of sin, pain and death, we pray, turn our eyes upon Jesus. Help us in the midst of trouble to look in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Father, give us today the food we need. Open our hearts for the spiritual food you prepared for us today and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Help our families to be strong and filled with love. And don't let us yield to temptation but rescue us from the evil one. We dedicate us, our families, to you, for your is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let's, uh, let's affirm Catherine for that singing there. I have to stand up and talk in front of you and it's nerve wracking. Imagine being a middle schooler having to sing in front of all of you. So uh, good job, we're proud of you and proud of all of you for being here. Thank you Lance for your children's story. We had three of our young people preach uh, maybe a couple months ago. I can't give you the exact date, but if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to go back onto our YouTube page and listen to it. Lance was one of the preachers there and I've, I've told them, you know, God might be calling you to, to be a pastor uh, and so, you know, I tell them, listen for God, but it might be happening. I know we encourage our kids to do a lot of other things, but you know, Ellen White said that we should encourage our kids more to consider the ministry. So I was actually at a chapel with all of them recently, and I asked them, hey, pray about being pastors already, all of them. So uh, we'll see what God has in store. So good to be with all of you today, and again, we are so blessed by this music, so thank you. Mrs. Fralick, and thank you, Mrs. Lanning. We appreciate it so much. My nine-year-old Levi uh, asked me a question not too many weeks ago that, that has kind of been stirring in my uh, spirit since then. He asked me, Dad, could Putin actually hit us with a nuclear missile? Uh, this course of this question, of course, developed in his brain as he listened in to the chatting of the adults around him, the news in the background of his world, uh, and the general chatter that happens at school. My boys say that some of this is being talked about. The question isn't stirring in me because it's something I'm focused on or I'm overly worried about. What stirred me about this question is this, that, that we live in a world where we're so advanced in our technology and we're so... Uh, supposedly sophisticated, and we have the ability to communicate to peoples in all parts of the world, and yet a nine-year-old still feels compelled to ask the very real and legitimate question, could we ever be hit by a nuclear weapon? As Levi's question was inside of me, last week we were driving to Ohio for my 25th uh, high school reunion, and the family was all asleep, it was late at night, and I was listening to a podcast by a few of my friends, and these friends uh, were talking about the unprecedented, unprecedented things happening in our world. And whenever I hear that word unprecedented, I, I, I kind of squirm. Really, is this really unprecedented? Never having happened before? But as my friends on the podcast continued to talk, Levi's question popped back into my brain. Dad, could could we be hit by a nuclear missile? Now, of course, that question is, is not unprecedented. I asked a similar question as a child growing up in the 80s when we were going through the Cold War and the Soviet Union was in existence. Those of you who are alive in 1962, between October 16 and October 28, the 13 days known as the Cuban Missile Crisis, I'm sure you asked that question, could a, uh, could a nuclear weapon hit us? I would guess that that question has been asked in various parts of the world, and I know that they're asking that question in, in Vyacheslav's homeland and in other places as well. But I continue to listen to that, 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 that podcast, and, and what I gathered from my friend's point was not that the events that we are going through are unprecedented, but the timing, the timing of those events are unprecedented. Let me illustrate this for you. These young people on this stage, all these young people and the young people that are out there, if they wanted to, at some point prior to the last two years, wanted to ask someone about what it was like to live or experience the threat of nuclear disaster, they would reach out to someone from maybe the 80s or someone in the 70s or more likely someone in the 60s. If they wanted to ask someone about what is it like to live in a country that's having a national discussion about race and, and tensions, not just in one pocket of, of the country, but, but literally in every city, every major city in the world and beyond. 
And they wanted to ask someone who had lived through that. And what was that like to have that, that national discussion? The last time we, we had really a, a true, honest national discussion would have been in the 1960s. And they'd have to go back and have, find someone there and, and talk to those people. What was it like to, to see people sprayed with hoses for walking across a bridge or chased by dogs for trying to sit at a, at a lunch counter? What, what, was that, what was that like? If the, peop, if the young people wanted to talk to someone about why their parents seemed stressed about this word called inflation. They would have to go back to 1981, which was the last time that inflation was rising at the current pace that it is rising. If they wanted to talk, if you wanted to talk to someone about why your parents are sighing every time they get back in their cars after they fill up their gas tanks. <laughs> have any of you been sighing? You know it's bad when I was in Ohio and it was $3.99 and I was like, whew, what a relief. <laughs> if they wanted to talk to someone about that, they would have to go back to 1973, which according to the World Bank is the last time that we saw this level of increase in our energy prices, 1973. They would have to have that discussion. If these young people wanted to talk to someone about what it is like to understand the tension that is felt in a nation in which the buildings that represent the seat of our democracy are overrun and, and damaged, how, how people shut down, if, if, even, if even only temporarily, our government. They couldn't talk to anyone. They'd have to go to a history book because the last time that happened was in August of 1814 when a foreign power stormed our capital. And of course, I forgot to mention as well, if they wanted to talk to someone about what it's like to, to deal with a national pandemic, a global pandemic, but what it's like here in this country to deal with a, nas with a pandemic, they would have to go back to 1918. They would have to find one of the 68 people still alive from 1918 to say, what is it like to live through and to deal with a pandemic? And finally, if these young people wanted to discuss how to navigate all of these things in the context of having all that information at their fingertips, at the click of a button, and being delivered through the destructive tools of social media. Well, there isn't a history book for that because that's truly unprecedented. None of us have had to deal with this in that context. And when I think of Levi's question, in the light of all those history points that I just shared, I believe that we can say that in this nation, and maybe even globally, but in this nation, at this time, we are living through an unprecedented era. Because all that I have described, all those events, and all the events that we have been going through, for the most part, have happened over the course of time. If you lived in the 60s, you lived through something. If you lived in the 70s, you lived through something. If you lived in the 80s, you lived 90s, and so on and so forth. But, but these young people and you have experienced all of these things compressed into 24 months. And that is truly unprecedented. And therefore, I believe it is a good time to remember who we are as a people, to share with some that may not know who we are as a people, and raise up the cry of Revelation chapter one and verse seven. Revelation chapter one and verse seven, in which John the Revelator wrote, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, and my Bible says amen, which means so let it be. We need to remember right now that in the context of our name, you guys go to Spencerville Adventist Academy, and that Adventist means that we believe that Jesus is coming again. We believe that he is coming soon. We believe that the world is not our home. And this matters, folks. This matters. 
Because some of us are living and operating and acting as if this world is our home. But Hebrews chapter 14 and verse 13 tells us, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Talking about the city of God, the new Jerusalem. John chapter 18 and verse 36, Jesus said these words, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my, my, my followers would fight for it so that I would not be delivered over to you. But my kingdom is not from this world. Philippians chapter three and verse 20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Some of us are operating like we've got to figure everything out here because this is our eternal home and that is just not the case. We are Adventists. We believe that Jesus is coming again and this is a temporary stopover until our, our eternal home. Now, the danger with this is that some of you might not realize this, but over the time as Adventists hear such a message, some of us tend to do something. We become closed in on ourselves. Oh, there's chaos and the world's coming to an end and so we, we shut in on ourselves and we stop operating as, as humans should operate. I know this personally. I had some family members, some distant family members who in the 80s, they, were, they, they started following a, a, a gentleman uh, who had kind of an offshoot of Adventism. Not David Koresh, a different one. <laughs> They're still alive. Uh, but, but, they, but this guy said, Jesus is coming in five years. And they believed him. And they lived in California. They went to school with me. I was out there in California. They went to school with me. They sold everything. And they moved out to the middle of somewhere, which was also known as nowhere. And, and they had no power, no electricity. They, everything operated on a, a windmill so that they couldn't. Well, five years came and went, and... Jesus didn't come back and they had nothing because Jesus was coming back so we've gotta, we've gotta come in and, and cloister ourselves. But you know, there's counsel in the Bible about how people who are not citizens of this world are to live as good citizens of this world even though we're waiting for another kingdom. In Jeremiah chapter 29 is one of those principles. Jeremiah chapter 29 God was writing to exiles like us. He was writing to exiles from Israel that were now in Babylon. And, and they do not want to be in Babylon. And, and they're looking forward to that time when they will go back to Israel, when they'll go back to Jerusalem, when they'll go back to their home. And Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 7 gives some, some great advice for us living in anticipation of the second coming of Jesus. In Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 7 the Bible says, but seek, and my Bible says welfare. Some of your Bibles say seek the peace. Some of your Bibles say seek the prosperity. But the actual Hebrew word there is, is shalom, which we know is, is peace. The, the Hebrew word for shalom has this deep guttural meaning. But seek the shalom of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on his behalf for in its shalom you will find your welfare. Seek the shalom of the city. We live according to this principle. That, that, that even though we are people living in anticipation of a better place, of a better land, we still are to operate in such a way that we want to bring blessings and, and justice and hope and peace and love into this world in which we live. We also live by the principle of Colossians chapter three, verses 23 and 24, where the Bible tells us whatever you do, Work heartily, work with all your might for the Lord. And you do this not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. When I think about the, the verses that say, this is not your home, don't think this is your home, don't act like this is your home, don't live like this is your home, and then I read the verses that say, operate like good citizens of this place that is not your home, work like good citizens of this place that are not your home, the, the way I merge those together is that, is that we are to live and to serve Jesus Christ as witnesses in this decaying world. We do not do these things thinking that we will ultimately make the world better. We don't do these things because we think that, that, that doing these things we're gonna fix all the ails of society. 
We do them as representatives of Jesus Christ so that he can receive glory even in this decaying world. We vote. We vote. We vote. Because we are good citizens of this world, not because the person we are voting for is going to be our savior, nor the person we are voting against is going to be our destroyer. We, we protect and care for the environment, not because of our political positions, but because Jesus made this world and his first command to Adam was to dwell in it and care for it. But we do this recognizing that ultimately caring for this world is not going to reverse the effects of sin. It's not. Romans tells us in the book of Romans that the entire earth groans under the weight of sin. We build houses and we start businesses not to give ourselves ease and comfort and money, but so that these can be tools used as witnesses for Jesus. So that, so that our homes can be opened up to people for hospitality and for, for hosting and for caring and for loving these people so that, so that our, our, our businesses can, can provide income in which can impact the Lord's work and so that we have a broader witness within the community. That's why we do these things. Now this is something I've had to learn. When I grew up as a kid, one of the things that I was taught is that you sneak into church, you sneak out of church, and then you sneak into bed in the afternoon and you rest the rest of the day. I thought that was, the, I thought that was Sabbath. And then I got married and my wife has made our house a turnstile on Sabbath afternoons. <laughs> and my kids love it. They think Sabbath is the coolest day ever. And I say praise God for that. But it's, hospitality, be open, be welcoming, love, welcome people so they can just drop by and I won't point out any of my friends that love to just drop by in here, <laughs> even though they are here. We love that about this place. But here's the thing, folks. We need to operate and do these things not thinking that we are going to cure the world's ails. Here's what we should understand as Seventh Amnes. Everything in history is moving towards and slowly edging towards destruction. That's what we need to understand. I, I say that because I'm worried that some of us, some of us are are operating, we're participating in politics and we're, we're, we're communicating in such a way that we think that, that if we just do enough, we're gonna kind of reverse this whole thing, that we're so powerful that we're gonna deal with sin here in this world. I believe in justice. You guys know my sermons. Some of you have told me you love my sermons. Some of you told me you don't love them. But I believe in justice. But I think that we need to recognize that there will never be any true justice until the kingdom of God. You know, as Christians, we should not be operating like the, the old Coca-Cola commercial. Do you remember the old Coca-Cola commercial? I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'll stop there because if you sing too much of a secular song in church, it becomes sinful, but just a little bit, you're okay. <laughs> but, but folks... Christians should know better. If we just get together and sing kumbaya, this world is not getting better. Listen to what the word of God says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go from, listen to this, from bad to worse. From bad to worse deceiving and being deceived. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verses nine through 12, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will rise and lead many astray, and because lawlessness will be increased, listen to this, the love of many will grow cold. As I thought about that, that phrase right there, the love of many will grow cold, I thought, 
This should be the motto of social media. The love of many will grow cold. You all don't grow up and be like some of us adults are being, where we are unrelentingly unkind to people. In fact, you should all get rid of your phones. Give them back to your parents. Tell them you don't want your phones anymore. (laughs) Stay away from social media. That's the strongest amen I got right there. See that? (laughs) Maybe I should turn to the parents and say, hey, be the parent, take away that phone, eh? I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, just saying, I'm just saying, sorry if I stepped a little too close there, I apologize. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter four and verses three and four, listen to this. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into mists or wander off into air. In other words, people are going to be saying, you know what, I don't like what the Bible says about that. Can I find a teacher who will put another spin on it so that that fits with who I am and what I'm about? And this is what the Bible says the world is going towards. Jesus himself said this, verse 22 of Matthew 24. He told us that if this time is not cut short that no one would survive. That's the world we're living in. If this time is cut short, no one will survive. Knowing all this as Adventists, what should we be teaching our young people? Should we we be worried and teaching them to panic? What should we be encouraging them to focus on every day? Should we tell them that if they just try hard enough, if they're just good enough, that this world is going to get better and everything's gonna be, to use an old phrase, hunky-dory? You guys say (laughs) hunky-dory? Not one of you, right? Don't, it's really not cool at all, so (laughs) hunky-dory. Should we teach them to rely on the things of this world that we think bring us Security, money, a good job, education. I love money, I'm not gonna lie. Well, I shouldn't say that because that says the love of money is the root of all evil. So I like money. Help pray for me, (laughs) Costin. I like having a good job. I like having an education. I endorse all these things. But these are not things that we should rely on. That we should rely on. What should we teach our young people? How should we as adults live so that we can model and teach our young people what it means to live in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ? There are many answers from the Bible that we could give, but I'm gonna close with Romans chapter 12. Ellen White, an author I like to read, said about Romans chapter 12 that it would be a profit for all of us to study it because it is a sermon from Paul to us to instruct us in our world. But in Romans chapter 12, I was too busy telling, quoting you that thing that it turned there. Romans chapter 12 and beginning in verse two, and I could just quote it, but Romans chapter, I'm just gonna quote it. Romans chapter 12 and verse two tells us this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good by God's standards, and what is acceptable and perfect according to God. Parents, grandparents, members of the church, young people, Jesus is asking us in the midst of all this chaos, and and you guys have experienced something that, that, that we cannot comprehend, and I know that it has been hard on so many of you, and mentally it's been tough on you, and we're praying for you, and we love you, and we are here to go through that with you. But, but, but this, this time, this, this struggle, God is calling us, calling the young people, calling the older people to live in preparation for Jesus' coming is to live different than the world. We are called to live unlike the world. Do not be conformed to the world. Don't be like the world. 
And Paul gives us then further down in chapter 12 a snippet of what that looks like. And I'm just going to read this and then say a few more words and I will be done. And I'm using my son's uh, New Living Bible, my son Dayton's New Living Bible, because I think that the language is, is most close to hopefully how we speak in this day. And here's what Paul says to us and to these young people about how we should live as not conforming to the world. Here's what it says. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. That means hate what is wrong according to this book, not just what we think is right or wrong. Love what is good. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. That means take delight in affirming each other and supporting each other. Every time you get the opportunity, tell your classmates, good job, affirm them. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Our confident hope is this, young people, that Jesus is coming again and you've had a horrible 24 months that you've had to live through, but I can promise you that when Jesus comes, you'll have eternity of joy and hope and love and peace. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. You know, when rough times come, the thing to do isn't to get on the internet and blast someone to write something, but, but continue to pray. Ask God to be with them. Ask God to be with you. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. In other words, don't, don't think of yourselves as better than others. And here's a great one, and this is one I'm still learning. And don't think you know it all. <laughs> Parents, we don't know it all, right? But we also know that sometimes we tell our kids, you don't know everything. Anyone else ever said that? <laughs> don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. In other words, if someone's done something wrong to you, don't go and try to do worse to them. Don't try to even do equal to what they did. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. All that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God who says, I will take revenge. I will deal with them. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals upon their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Young people and us older people too, we are living in an unprecedented time. And Jesus is asking us, he's asking you, and he's asking me, if we will live in this unprecedented time in an unprecedented way for him. Not becoming overwhelmed with what is happening around us, but rather choosing that when the world goes towards hate, we choose love. That the world, when the world is trying to become more greedy, oh, we're worried about the economy and we're pulling in, we become more generous. When the world is less, un, less forgiving and, and, and more into canceling people and, and destroying people's lives and trying to tear down and point out people's wrongs, we, we choose to be more forgiving and show mercy and grace. That when the world is lazy and not wanting to work hard, that, that we outdo everyone in, in working for everyone, not just for those we like, but for everyone. 
We need to remember who we are. We are Seventh-day Adventists. We believe this world is on a destruction course, and yet, even though it's on a course towards destruction, we believe that God asks us to live in this world with such amazing love that his light can still shine in this world's darkness. And young people, remember these words of Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble. But Jesus said, take heart, for I have overcome the world. You will have trouble, but Jesus has overcome the world, and he is coming back for each and every one of us that give our hearts to him. And he loves you more than you can ever imagine. And he, in his patience with this suffering world, is doing so that each of you and each of us will say yes to him. We love you. We love you. Let us live in an unprecedented way with love for others in this unprecedented time. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the assurance that we have and you're coming back. And I pray, Jesus, that that assurance will give us peace, but also that it will motivate us, that it will empower us through the power of your spirit to live different than this world, to not operate like the world, but to operate like Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Lord Jesus, however we came into this place, may we leave this place with that being our story, that Jesus is our blessed assurance, that he is coming again. And until then, we will live a life of praise and love 
in this very dark world. And may you, Jesus, receive all the glory and may others more come to know you because they have seen Christians living in unprecedented ways in unprecedented times. In your name I pray, amen.